Hello, and welcome to the Pricing for the Planet podcast, the podcast that explores the intersection of business and sustainability. I'm your host, Fabian Cross, and I'm here to figure out with you how to monetize sustainability. Indeed, for us, the only path to amplifying and accelerating sustainability is by framing it as a driving force for business. Whether you're a business leader, an entrepreneur, or simply curious about how sustainability can be monetized, our podcast is here for you. Today, I'm super excited to host Massimiliano Costa Curta, Chief Product Officer at Full Truck. Massimiliano, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be here, Fabian. Thank you. So you, you know the podcast, we, we always start from the end. So first question, if listeners could take away just one key message from this podcast, what would it be? Well, let me start by saying something probably trivial, but very important. That is, uh, um, we are exactly in the middle of a, of a revolution. I think that uh, everybody knows that, or at least everybody working in tech uh, uh, has to acknowledge that something very, very impactful is happening. And I'm referring to this, you know, new wave of uh, uh, AI innovations and AI technology, especially uh, generative AI, which uh, is really having a big impact uh, in our daily life. I truly really think that these new technologies uh, are uh, very, very impactful also uh, from the sustainability perspective, because they can be really leveraged to alleviate the, uh, how can I say, the everlasting tension that there exists between business and sustainability. Uh, <clears throat> these technologies are really reshaping our understanding of how we can harmonize profitability and ethical and environmental considerations. And uh, I'm far from saying that uh, uh, these technologies will say today. So sustainability is a marathon, it's something that cannot be achieved uh, overnight. But I truly think that uh, these new technologies can be the key points uh, to do something which can speed up our path towards sustainability. And even more important, Sustainability is, uh, has many sides, right? And uh, one of the most important, actually not the most important, but one very important side is, uh, is pricing, which is not exactly the top of the list conversation that you hear when it comes to sustainability. But prices are very important because they are the interfaces between companies and their market. And prices incorporate exactly what the companies care about. Now, up from now, it's been mainly, you know, financial metrics like revenue or cost plus markup or something like that. But it cannot be like that from, from now on. So they have to incorporate also other aspects, like the things that they are doing for the world. And uh, I truly think that uh, AI methods, uh, machine learning, all the things that we are going to discuss in this podcast can be leveraged to do, to find the right price, find the right balance between prices and uh, you know, long-term sustainability goals of the companies. Perfect. And, and just like full disclosure, I, I've discovered you through your great research around multi-armed bandit pricing. Could you delve into this while introducing you? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe I'll start by saying a couple of words about me. And uh, to be honest, it's a very awkward moment for me because I just started a, a new position at Full Track, as you said, a chief product officer. But before may, maybe getting there, I can spend a couple of words about what I've been doing in the last, uh, well, uh, 17 years, probably. So my previous professional experience was dedicated to uh, build up my previous company, which is called Rulex. Now, Rulex uh, is completely different from Full Track. The main goal of Rulex as a company is to build uh, the best end-to-end -end data management solution out there. <clears throat> so long story short, I've been exposed for all these years uh, to all the, the things related to data, to machine learning, to artificial intelligence, and I've been lucky enough uh, to apply them with the Rulex to very large corporations across the world, uh, especially in the area of supply chain, like CPG or MDC companies. But Rulex is very horizontal, right? So it's, uh, it's a company that uh, um, manages data, regardless of them being, uh, uh, you know, coming from supply chain or financial services. Um, so full track is a completely different story. So it's a very vertical value proposition, which is based on uh, trying to build uh, um, we can call it a marketplace uh, for logistics, where uh, the main goal of the company is to uh, 
try to create uh, an ecosystem where shippers can find the best carriers to uh, fulfill their shipments, right? And this is not a, an easy task because, uh, you know, logistics is a very fragmented market. It's a very inefficient market. And when I talk about inefficiencies, I'm not only referring to operational inefficiencies, but also coming back to sustainability, there is also a big problem because while we are talking, a huge, huge amounts of track are moving around completely empty. This is not only a financial problem, it's also a sustainability problem because these are basically a seed or two emissions that we could completely avoid. So one of the goals for the company is exactly this, try to limit as much as we can the amount of shipments that are done by trucks completely full, completely empty, I'm sorry. And on the other hand, as I mentioned, the fact that we are a marketplace, uh, I mean, you perfectly know of more famous marketplaces like Uber and I don't know, Airbnb and stuff like that. Again, pricing for these kinds of businesses is really, really crucial because this is exactly where the business plays its game, right? Marketplaces basically gets revenue from the difference between, uh, in our case, what we take from the shippers and what we allocate to the carriers. So getting the right price, in this case, getting the right margin is where we risk to break our neck, if you know what I mean. Because if we take, uh, you know, if we, if we take a, a too big uh, margin, then carriers get angry and obviously they don't want to work with us anymore. If the margin is too little, then we cannot sustain our business. So again, finding the right, the right price at the right moment uh, is absolutely crucial for us. And this one of the main reasons I started to take this uh, challenge and I, you know, so to get a chance to apply my knowledge on, on dynamic pricing and getting back to multi unbanded. So your initial, que your initial question was, uh, how did I first uh, get in touch with this uh, uh, kind of technologies? Now, my story is uh, probably pretty different from the other stories in, the, in these cases because uh, my knowledge didn't come up from universities or academia, but actually I had a pretty traumatic experience meaning <laughs> that some time ago I interviewed for a company, a US-based company who is working uh, in the uh, airline industries, okay, and they, they basically work for revenue management in the airline industry, and you know how little are the margin in that case. So pricing, again, is super important in that case. And in the interview process was very tough. I think uh, eight or nine uh, different rounds with different interviewers, and I think I did pretty well, except for this one session with this guy who completely focused the interview on, on this kind of technologies, on uh, multi arm bandit and re uh, reinforcement learning. Now, the bad news for me is that uh, I never heard about them. So I was completely destroyed, <laughs> to be completely honest. So the bad news for me was that I didn't get an offer. But uh, when I overcome the, the depression of not getting an offer, I started to think, wow, but why there is a company which is already pretty, pretty consolidated that is focusing so much on this kind of of technologies that I didn't know anything about. So I started my research and I, I discovered a completely new world of, of techniques that uh, I, I fell in love with because I think they are truly, truly impactful, truly, truly uh, useful, especially if you don't have data up front. Yeah. So maybe we can speak about uh, how they work and how they can help. Yeah, sure. I mean, go again. I mean, I'm fascinated by, you know, multi-arm brand, especially applied to pricing. We do a lot of multi-arm branded, but more like in the digital world. And when I discovered your paper about multi-arm branded pricing, I was like, really, wow, that's such a cool topic. Indeed, it is. And maybe, you know, for, for, for the audience, we can spend just a couple of words about uh, what multi-arm branded are, starting from the name. So, uh, first of all, one hand bandits are, bandits are nothing but uh, slot machines. The ones that you find in, in casinos, right? And uh, uh, the arm of the bandit is nothing but lever that you pull to see if you have won or if you have, uh, if you have lost. Now, multi-arm bandits are called in this way because basically all the problems that can be tackled with these strategies can be uh, uh, reduced to uh, a scenario where you are in a room with several one arm bandit, and your task is to discover with different win rates, obviously. And yet your task is to discover as fast as possible, as quick as possible, the, the slot machine with the highest win rate. So, your question is mainly uh, as soon as you have done a couple of attempts and you have learned something, should you stick with what you have learned? That is, you should exploit your knowledge, 
or you should also explore the options that you're maybe you, you, have, you have left uh, up to now. So multi arm bandit is a, is a branch of reinforcement learning which actually works on this kind of problem. The balance between exploitation and exploration. And uh, when it comes to pricing, that's exactly the same. Your levers are nothing but your price points. That is, you have several price points that you can put on the table uh, with, your, with your market, for example. And uh, the question is, you have a previous knowledge of, of about some of those price points. What do you do? Do you stick with them or do you or can you afford to go exploring other price points? Now, what this kind of strategies uh, help you with is to uh, get to an answer uh, as fast as possible. And for this reason, uh, I think I'm very fascinated with them because as I was mentioning before, you don't need a lot of data up front. So it's not like machine learning that you have to you know, accumulate a lot of records like um, thousands, tens of thousands of records because you get up with something meaningful for you, but you can immediately start. Okay, and the mechanism is very simple. So you, you do an action, you try a price, for example, and you get a reward. And this reward is, uh, for example, you have sold or you haven't sold your product. And this is really the interesting part, which, which can, can, can build a bridge with sustainability. Because currently, this reward is always taken as, a, you know, uh, my revenue out of this product. You know, again, only financial metrics. But what if we start to include, incorporate in the, in, the, in the reward measure something like, I don't know, energy waste, energy consumption, water consumption, these kind of metrics. Yeah. And the, the, reward, the reward becomes something uh, more sophisticated that can help finding the right price to allocate the product uh, by taking into account also other dimensions which are related to sustainability. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not thinking that uh, uh, multi arm bandit, uh, again, will save the day by simply doing something like incorporating in the reward uh, sustainability measures, but I truly think that they can be used to, uh, to tackle this kind of problem. And also, just to close on this topic, there is also an evolution, which is contextual bandits. That is, uh, instead of only considering, you know, your price point, your possible actions, uh, there is also the possibility in these algorithms to include the context uh, these actions are supposed to act on. For example, the context in the case, I don't know, of an e-commerce could be uh, the information of the user that is navigating on your, the information that you have available, that of the user that is navigating on your website. So you can tailor um, the, the best action depending on specific information about uh, the user that uh, you're dealing with. So they are pretty powerful. And uh, again, I think I'm going to have fun using them in, uh, in full track. Yeah. And I think you covered that. And for me, that was really, that it's really the <coughs> missing piece between, you know, the move from, you know, 1P to 3P, which is, you know, planet, profit, and uh, one, uh, planet, people, sorry, people, planet, profit. And, and I think it was a big question from the entire pricing community, which was like, yeah, it sounds great to do, you know, to move from profit to the 3P, but how do you do that, you know, like concretely and pragmatically? And I think your approach, you know, using multi-arm bandit or contextual uh, bandit could, could really solve that. You can, you don't, you are not focused only on profit anymore. You can really balance your profit with your CO2 emission, with your, you know, social KPI. And you can make that into your decision making. Yeah, but let me also play the devil's advocate for a second. Okay, uh, I'm with you. Obviously, I love these strategies. But uh, um, you know, I was reading this this article in the Financial Times uh, a month ago, where uh, the, the focus was it was exactly on uh, dynamic pricing. Now, I think dynamic pricing is a very powerful strategy, but we shouldn't uh, forget that. Uh, uh, also, consumers have their rights. Now, in this article in the Financial Times, they were saying that, for example, dynamic pricing is being used currently also in pubs in England, where where they are, uh, you know, increasing the price of beers depending on the you know the increase of demand in busy evenings, for example. Yeah. So the question becomes also an ethical question: that is, uh, uh, is it correct? to you know, ask for more money only because people are willing to spend more money. So again, sustainability, as, uh, as I was saying before, is, uh, 
is a very, very complex thing. So uh, I'm saying this because uh, there's also the other side of the story, which is the consumer side of the story. So yes, I truly think that uh, these algorithms can help, uh, but I think also that we, can, we have to be careful on the way we leverage them. And I love this example because when we really push the model with the contextual approach, you could really say, okay, how many beers, you know, this guy, you know, already had, and then you can adjust the pricing based on like, okay, that's the health benefit, you know, that's social benefit, that's a social risk, you know, of starting a fight or all, all that stuff. And you can really tailor this price to not just, I want to make more money as a, you know, at the, at the pub owner, but you know, like taking into account, you know, the, the benefit of the consumers as well. Correct. And I think that's very, very important to do that as well. <coughs> Absolutely. And so, again, you know, I'm kind of obsessed, but so do you think that this kind of technologies uh, will be, you know, valid approaches for monetizing sustainability in the coming years? I, I, I think so. I think so. For, for a very simple reason. I mean, um, uh, what I've seen, what I witnessed, what we are witnessing, especially in these new uh, startups and new companies that are, are growing up, um, the main approach that uh, the companies uh, who have a big focus on sustainability is uh, what I would call value pricing, right? So what is value pricing? Basically, it's not simply asking money for the product or the service that they're selling on the market, but for you know, some sort of greater good, which is associated with the, um, with the uh, product that you're putting on the market. So value, value pricing in this case is very present for those companies who are focusing on sustainability. But the key point is that uh, even if I'm asking more money because I'm more sustainable, I'm more careful about uh, uh, the energy that I waste, uh, the energy consumption, the water that I'm wasting. Uh, where should I put the price? What's the right price to ask for, to my consumers? So yes, I truly think that they can be, they, they, this, these technologies can be leveraged to monetize this kind of approach because it's correct, in my opinion, to ask for more money if the value that I'm bringing is going um, outside the simple scope of the product that I'm selling. But the point is that I have to be really careful in doing that because uh, if I go too high in the request and even the you know most attached uh, consumer, mo most careful consumer to the, uh, to the sustainability cause uh, will might become a price sensitive consumer. So there is always a, always a threshold that cannot be made. So yes, I truly think that they, 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 they should monetize sustainability throughout this, uh, these technologies. But again, being careful in doing it in the right way. Yeah, 100%. And actually, it's funny you mentioned so, so value or value-based pricing because we had a, an episode with Stefan Liotsu who wrote, I don't know, like, you know, almost a dozen books around this concept of value-based pricing. And that was one of his key points, like to be, to be, to change the mindset, to apply value-based pricing in the world of sustainability and to treat sustainability as an innovation inside this, you know, framework of value-based pricing. So hundred percent. One thing I wanted to, to pick up your brain on this one because you, you have such an exposure on like new technologies and new techs and you know new uh, algorithm. Do you foresee emerging pricing strategies and technologies stemming from this wave of sustainability focused startups? Uh, that's a, that's a very uh, interesting question. So uh, well. <laughs> Let me start by uh, giving you the short answer. Well, I don't think that uh, startups are really, really leveraging enough uh, pricing in this context. I mean, and this is the result of the huge hype that we see, especially in this moment, uh, due to AI. So if you are, um, for example, a founder of a new startup, uh, how, you, how do you get investors excited? By speaking about pricing or by speaking about AI? So again, I know that I'm teasing you, but uh, this is what I'm seeing, right? So, uh, so the, the short answer is uh, I don't think that they are leveraging a pricing strategy enough. But still, I've seen something that is going in that direction. For example, I've been hearing uh, some time ago about, uh, I think it was a startup who was trying to put together 
uh, pricing related to uh, weather conditions. So the startup basically was uh, some sort of utilities uh, energy provider, I don't, I don't remember the details, who was trying to create an adaptive pricing depending on the weather conditions. So when the, condi- when the weather conditions are uh, better, for example, I can tap into my renewable energies and ask for a lower fare right, to my consumer. So I can also s- somehow educate my consumer to act accordingly to make uh, uh, you know, uh, the energy consumption more sustainable. Now, is it successful? Is that being successful? Uh, personally, I don't know. But I think it was a good idea because uh, instead of, uh, you know, putting technologies behind, uh, in front of everything, they tried a different approach. So, and this is uh, one mistake that I think founders shouldn't do. I mean, they shouldn't start from technologies. And this, and I, I mean, I've been there, by the way. So you should start from business. You should start from what actually really could have an impact for, on your customers, on your consumers. The technologies comes later. And the same thing applies to uh, this new wave of AI. So again, I know that I didn't really give you very, very meaningful examples, but I think that's a very complex conversation to, to lead, especially in a moment where everybody's looking at AI, everybody's talking yeah. about AI. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I fully align, which is actually a good transition because, you know, one other question is like, we see a lot of people like eager to become, you know, part of the sustainability initiative. Yeah. According to you, you know, what guidance would you give them? Again, very, very tough question. Um, I think that the, the, yeah, the first, the first advice, uh, it, it's linked to what I was saying before. So uh, I, I hear a lot, a lot of founders, a lot of people, you know, saying something like, I need to do something for the planet. I need to, you know, to do, to, to, to get on board on these sustainability things because I care about the planet, I care, I care about my family, I care, by, I care about my children and stuff like that, which is completely, completely understandable, and I share that. But I personally don't think that's the right way to start things. I personally think that it's more important to start from what you love to do and what or what you're good at, and then start from there and understand that which impact that can have on the planet in the right way. In some sense, full track is the same thing. It's not that we um, claim to be, you know, uh, sustainability heroes. We are good at managing logistics. But inside logistics, there is one thing which is really, really harming the environment, which is uh, empty trucks getting around back and forth. So since we are good at managing logistics, what can we do to do something better for the greater good? In my opinion, this is a better approach to start uh, something which can really can have an impact and to go, you know, to, to follow along this uh, new sustainability movement. Then there are other aspects, obviously. I mean, it's not that uh, you have to be a sustainability hero to be more sustainable, right? You can start small, for example, by simply changing your, your habits in your family, in your workplace, by reducing waste and stuff like that. So. I think that it's important. The education is very important because the more educated we become, the more we will be able to create. The, I think the most powerful leverage that humanity knows when it comes to change, which is peer pressure. So it will become uh, unacceptable not to be sustainable. But you have to start from yourself, from your family, from your community, right? And obviously, it goes without saying. Uh, well, keep being informed with Postcat podcasts like yours, understanding what's happening in the world, how things are changing, how, how, how the focus are shifting and, you know, creating a network. I think that these are my advices to, to be sustainable in our little house. Amazing. So Massimiliano, thank you so much. One thing, because I like this podcast because we have like two topics. One is really like, you know, multi-arm bandit around pricing. And the other one is full truck. So if the listeners, if they want to hear more about full truck, where can they go? They can go on our LinkedIn page uh, so they can uh, follow up. Uh, the, the page has just been created because the company actually changed its name uh, last month. So everybody's absolutely welcome to, to come with us in this, uh, in this journey. Perfect. And it's, it's easy to find. It's full track, you know, so like the, the warning is super simple. Perfect. Again, Massimiliano, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. We, we hope you find it insightful and inspiring. If you want to stay connected with us, learn more, and continue this sustainability journey and discussion, please subscribe to our biweekly digest on www.pricingfortheplanet.com. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Pricing for the Planet, or myself, Fabian Cross. But listeners, we also need your help. By leaving a comment and rating these podcasts, you are not just giving us feedback. You are also helping boost the visibility of those critical discussions. Every comment, every like, every share help us reach more people and spread the word about our mission. And don't forget, the only path to amplifying and accelerating sustainability is by framing it as a driving force for business. Thank you for your time, your interest, and your commitment to sustainability. Be well.